from, uh, from uh, The Ohio State University, which we get made fun of now because of. Um, Can you see is it recording or just our? We good? Okay, we're good. Awesome. Uh, so I teach at The Ohio State University. Uh, I've taught there for probably about uh, maybe since 2008, so 12 years. Um, I teach um, in the College of Education in the Department of Teaching and Learning. I got my PhD in art education at Ohio State, but um, in Ohio State it's separated, so the College of Arts is one college and the College of Education is a different one. And so I got my degree in this one, but I work in this one. Um, so what I do really is I'm into uh, arts integrated teaching, learning, research, and activism. Um, and a lot of what I do though is I work with doing arts-based pedagogies and arts-based research and methods with non-art teachers. So not you guys, but people who are going to go in and teach elementary school or middle school or high school um, are usually the people I work with and people who are going to go teach college too. So I do a lot of that um, and equity and diversity is kind of the other area I specialize in in our, uh, in our department. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Um, I have a couple things here. I'm happy at any point in time. I'm happy to answer questions or field questions. Um, also, as I, I told you guys at the beginning, I'm happy to leave this PowerPoint or send this PowerPoint. Um, and I'm also happy to answer any questions later. If you think of questions, um, my email address is pretty accessible. Dr. Lewis will have it as well. So, so any of that. Um, I'm super excited to be here. So let me, I'll just run through these, some of these things. So, um, just like this. So one of the things I like to stress is um, throughout this presentation and through other presentations I do is the, the benefits that come from um, acknowledging people's identities and how much difference that can make uh, around things particularly that we think of as being kind of inconsequential. Um, the whole thing about respecting people's preferred pronouns, uh, having people give their preferred pronouns and then respecting those, I can't stress that enough, um, just what it means to people. Have information. So, kind of step through these three steps. Um, in education, I feel like you have to take one of these three positions because I, I just kind of talked about like neutral, there's no such thing as neutrality. So you can either be uh, against this stuff or you can be kind of for it. Uh, and I work with a great one of my advisees is a um, high school social studies teacher and has been super impressive to me because of his approach to things. Because when people come and say things like, maybe we shouldn't wear Black Lives Matter shirts, he's like, so what you're really saying is, if, like, so he takes this really like, if this is equality and equity, and this is what you want, then what you are doing and saying is not matching up to that. And so I'm really uh, learning a lot from, from working with this guy around stuff and around uh, how can you develop teachers uh, into just these categories. So allies are straight allies, people who, um, you know, support equity. And with LGBTQ stuff, it's around homophobia, gender, transphobia, biphobia. Um, so we talk about allies, and then we talk about advocates. So allies are people who kind of, you know, are on your side and agree with you. Advocates are people who, you know, step up and take uh, a more active, uh, more kind of pro positive, proactive role around issues. And then um, Bettina Love, I believe it is, who's come up and talked about this idea of accomplices um, or accessories. That's what I like to think of it. Um, so not just people who are on your side, but people who are actively helping you get things done that change systems. Um, so those are the kind of roles we think about. Um, so as you guys, most of this is um, in your lifetimes, really. So there's been a lot of progress legally around um, LGBTQ issues. Uh, so there was the Don't Ask, Don't Tell thing, which um, Bill Clinton, to his uh, you know, detriment, to his shame, started that, I'd say. Um, but it was repealed, the Defense of Marriage Act, um, again, another Clinton thing. Yeah, get some good, get some bad. Um, in 2003, when Massachusetts legalized uh, gay marriage, or as they like to call it, marriage, um, or marriage equity. In response to that, there was a huge flurry nationwide of states trying to states who were uh, banning gay marriage really explicitly. In Ohio, I believe we banned it effectively three times, three separate times. 
Um, at which point I was like, I told my partner, like, I get it. I get it that you don't like gay people. I'm cool. You know, I kind of like, you don't have to keep passing laws. We get it. Um, yeah. But so then, but after Oberfell and Hodges, the Federal Marriage Equality Act um, supersedes all of those local issues. And so, you know, in the past five years, there's been a big sea change around uh, marriage equality. And in a lot of ways, I feel like that um, gives us all a little bit more um, solid footing to stand on in terms of being allies, advocates, and accessories and accomplices to things. Um, you know, things are legal. I don't see really where you stand. Um, we have any standing to say that it's immoral. But that's also a really philosophical point. Uh, so I have the statistics I'll share with you, kind of a bullet through because, you know, nobody really loves to look at a lot of statistics. Um, and I used to have a guessing game, but I never would. Sure. Um, these are from the 2017 National School Climate Survey. There's a 2019 one out, I think probably in the middle of this year. So I haven't updated these statistics. Um, they show usually show some improvement around things, but they do tend to um, stay a little bit steady around stuff. But if you are really curious about updates, they can get those to you. Um, so if you look at school safety, from what kids said, from school safety, you can kind of see that about um, who felt unsafe because of their orientation. You can see like here's around 50%. So you can see who felt safe because of their expression, their gender expression, using this, that. Um, and a lot of times these two things can be kind of tied together, but one of the things that happens is People who are ne not necessarily LGBTQ get lumped in with it because of perceived gender or sexuality or things. So, you know, effeminate um, boys can get picked on regardless of what their gender or sexuality, how they experience it. Other people can experience it differently. Um, and so that can be unsafe for people who aren't LGBTQ. Um, people who missed a day of work, uh, the outer day of school per month, people who avoid bathrooms, um, and people who just don't come for school functions. Because why would you come back if you're already having a hard time? Uh, so in terms of people who, the amount of anti-LGBTQ uh, remarks at school, um, again, you can see here's about the 50% line. How many people here today is a slur, homophobic comments, gender, or transphobia? This one kills me every time. How many faculty and staff, how many faculty and staff are saying anti-LGBTQ? And one of the students in the docu in the documentary thing I'll show you later. One of the students says that it, to me, really, it's the most poignant and heartbreaking point of the whole thing. Um, so here you can see, kind of again, sexual orientation, gender expression, um, and gender. You can kind of go with what you're saying. The harassment, and assault, people who are getting verbally harassed, people who are being physically harassed or assaulted. And then we're seeing these two new kind of um, online cyberbullying too, which, you know. Um, harassment and assault, people reporting that. Um, but then we see this really big number of, this is how many people um, don't report. And the reason people don't report is somebody tries to get them. And so a lot of times kids learn, like they go to the administration, they get to a staff member, they tell them, and nothing happens. Or, worse, it ramps it up because nothing happens. And so people feel kind of empowered to continue the bullying in that kind of way. So, so it's a little, I mean, it's a little catch-22 for students, for queer students to think about, like I can't, I need to tell to get protection, but I tell them nothing improves. So there are a lot of uh, school policies that are still enacted that are um, anti-LGBTQ, you can kind of see this. Sometimes people are still just, you know, there's a lot about, the PDA rule gets really super enforced around queer kids, I think, you know, um, or it exists, but I don't think it's really enforced much outside of that for a lot, of, in a lot of places. Um, getting excluded from sports, uh, having, you know, LGBTQ clothing or symbols restricted, not having GSAs, gay straight alliances, It, event and gender date restrictions, like you can only come to the prom with us an opposite sex um, date.
Yeah, so if we just kind of uh, wrap it around, uh, kind of come down to it, a lot of LGBTQ students, most LGBTQ students experience some kind of related discrimination at school. Um, and a lot of times it can be around things like toilet facilities, naming and misnaming of students. Um, but this is what happens. The students who experience any of these kinds of discrimination, they're more likely to stick school, they're more likely to have lower GPAs, have lower self-esteem and school uh, belonging, higher levels of uh, depression, uh, they're more likely to drop out. We are seeing that more people have um, access to LGBTQ related things with internet resources. Um, a lot more students are reporting that there are gay straight alliances at schools. Um, in addition to that, I think it's in addition to just gay straight alliances, we're seeing more teachers kind of take on individual roles as kind of a safe space or as a, as a visible ally in some ways. And, and the GLSEN um, surveys are not capturing that. So some of the things that can happen or some of the ways that we can really support for you. Um, Anti-bullying measures at school have had a really positive effect on uh, how it kind of bleeds over to LGBTQ stuff, supporting them. Um, when there are supports in schools such as GSAs or teachers, um, you know, administrators, uh, any of those kinds of support services, when those things are in place, that LGBTQ students are less likely to be victims, they're less likely to hear gay bashing kind of remarks or homophobic remarks. Um, it, it just really drops a lot of that kind of stuff out of that they're less likely to go to school. They usually, um, you know, they get to kind of express themselves or be themselves at school in ways that are um, more positive for them. So they're likely, when there are the supports there, is that students are more likely to report things because they believe something's going to happen. And they just feel like they belong because again, they're just being recognized. Like, not just recognized, but they're kind of being um, recognized and affirmed in some ways. So let's go down here. So what you can do as educators, again, one of the things you can do at district levels is to, to agitate for or to kind of um, advocate for uh, anti-bullying measures around the LGBT stuff. Um, at the school level, if there's not a gay straight alliance at the school that you're in, uh, I recommend, probably not as a brand new teacher uh, necessarily taking that on, um, but that's really a great opportunity I think and it's um, often, often in my experiences, it's teachers who aren't necessarily queer who have an easier time taking those roles on um, just because you just don't face some of the, you know, the same kind of uh, biases and stereotypes and the resistance that uh, the teachers do. And like I said before, you can always, um, this idea of making your classroom a safe space and labeling that somehow visibly, I think really is um, helpful for, for kids uh, and probably for faculty, other you know, colleagues and faculty as well. And particularly, I think art educators have a really nice range of what is kind of available to deal with in art classrooms for the most part. Um, because I think we have so much flexibility around issues of dealing with issues of identity and expression and inquiry um, in those kinds of ways, I think that it gives us a lot of flexibility to open up what we, uh, what we do uh, to students who feel marginalized you know, due, to, due to any number of reasons. Some of those include, um, one of the things that doesn't happen a lot, or probably happens more now than it used to, but is the, the idea of referencing uh, queer artists and, and actually you know, naming that explicitly. Uh, a lot of times we've seen that be totally glossed, totally glossed over, left out, uh, minimized in terms of things like Felix Gonzalez Torres, people talk about his art, uh, his lover Ross is his uh, close friend, I believe in one of the textbooks that you're supposed to have in place. He had a really close friend, and he was sad about losing his best friend. That's true. Um, so, not that you need to be running down the list of people's sexuality when you're doing things, but we, you know, when you start mentioning people's personal lives and things, it's a natural, it should be a natural thing to include that. And so often, that's the part that's not included. It's included for everybody else, 
but not here. Um, again, you have people like, you kind of see it, I'll leave these notes for you. People like Ed Check um, and Jim Sanders and the people in our field who are talking about what happens, um, kind of how art educators can, can work in their rooms and bring these subjects into, uh, into the kind of collective discourse. Uh, and people give, like Ed Check gives a lot of um, examples about his own artwork, he uses his own artwork to reflect on his kind of autobiographical experiences being gay and growing up in Texas. Out, out of, maybe not growing up there, but. Um, not, I'm not trying to say people in art education should be therapists. Um, I don't necessarily believe that's true at all, but I do think there are therapeutic qualities for art education um, and for, for students to have the opportunity to express um, that things that they're thinking and feeling and that they, these things can be about their own identity or about other people's identities. Um, and I think uh, something that, that I was just like in and again is I think students are more capable of dealing with much more uh, complex, uh, subtle, nuanced and complicated things than we want to give them credit for. I feel like we really, uh, as adults, want to censor a lot of what kids get to talk about because we don't think that they sure enough or that they should be talking about it um, and I, I really am convinced that kids uh, have a lot more um, facility with and ability to kind of deal with these than we let them. Um, so one of the things that I really like to talk about and what the video I'll show you guys today is really about is this idea of um, archivism and these two, um, these two educators, Sandoval and Lagori, Talk about, they were talking originally about this woman, um, Judy Baca, who worked in Los Angeles uh, with primarily Latino populations in Los Angeles to do public murals. Um, and she's been doing it for like 20 or 30 years now. Uh, and they're phenomenal. Like, you can see, like these historical um, kind of counter narrative murals that are, that are about kind of the native peoples from the air, that part of Los Angeles and about you know, the Latine, Latinx people in the area. Um, and so that's who they're talking about originally is this idea of like how you take art and activism and turn this into kind of artivism. Um, and I think really that they they were really applying it to um, to youth, and they were applying it particularly to Latina youth, Latinx youth. And then they, um, but to me, it immediately makes sense as a much broader thing uh, that you can take this art and activism and combine them um, for a lot for many populations. So it seemed really transferable to me in a lot of ways. Um, it's a term that I, I think of a lot because I feel like it's, um, I think it's where the power of art, some of the power of art resides, um, particularly in education. Um, so yeah, so we have this idea of art and activism. And then I had this like tip, I had this list of, oh, excuse me, so I'm watching it pop up. So working kind of um, with resources and some other people, this is kind of the list that came up with like, what are the top 10 or what are 10 teaching tips for art educators? Need to create and maintain a safe environment. Um, prevent hate speech and derogatory terms around gender and sexuality. That seems like it's a big deal for people. Um, all you have to do is say stop, we don't use that language here. One of the things I'd like to stress, and I don't know if I say it on here, um, is the value of having a, a, a pat response at hand. I'm just knowing if a kid says the word fag, you can turn around and say like, oh, I'm sorry, we don't use that word. You know, that's not, we don't use the term in here. Or whatever phrases you kind of build. Um, it's a lot easier to um, confront those things if you have a phrase and you just do it. Um, one of the, I have a phrase that I've developed over time. Um, it developed as, uh, much like artivism, it developed about racism. But I, again, it's applicable. When my grandmother was dying, I spent a lot of time around my southern uh, friends and family and old church folk who got into an elevator with me and started talking about the Mexicans. The Mexicans this, and the Mexicans that, and I just stood there horrified, thinking like, oh my god. First of all, they're being so racist. Second of all, I, I don't know what to say to these people, and so I'm just stunned, and I'm thinking, Oh my God, my silence makes me complicit. Like, I, I, I don't know what to do. I just, and I, I did nothing. I just stood there silently and seethed. Um, 
But then I realized, like, I've got to have some. Like, that, I cannot be, I cannot be standing around people thinking I'm thinking about their opinion. And that's not how I'm gonna play it. Um, and so, well, I don't encourage you guys to really use this as your line. Uh, my kind of approach has been to um, overdramatically gasp and clutch my fake pearls um, and say, oh, it's not racist. Uh, and you can use that for anything. Oh, it's not homophobic. Any of that. So feel free to develop your own approach to that. But I found really that just having, having a response makes you use it. Not having it makes you stand around like me, like a dumbass, waiting for something to come up in your head that you can say to you know, people you know since you were tiny. So, I totally encourage that. Um, any of these other things too, including the LGBTQ art artists, um, naming them, it's, I have an activity, I don't necessarily think we're gonna do it, but one of the activities that you can do is to ask people, like I can ask you guys to name uh, living or contemporary LGBTQ artists and any of their work. Um, and it's kind of hard for most people, so, I, so I'm not gonna put you on the spot, I'm not gonna do it, but. Uh, but think about that. What LGBTQ artists do you know? Um, that's really kind of what I have in terms of information about background stuff. I can tell you a little bit more about the video that you're gonna that we're gonna watch. Um, so the video we'll show you guys is a 30 minute video that, that we talked about in the chapter as well. Um, a little bit of background, I guess, is that. It was not originally my product, my, my project. A, a really good friend of mine, Lee Yesbaum, um, is a digital filmmaker um, in Columbus, and she was really interested in working with queer youth to tell their own stories as a document, and, and simultaneously with kind of the artivism aspect of it. How do we um, both make this kind of um, prod product, and then how do we use the process to train kids about how to use documentary filmmaking? Um, as, a, as a tool for equity and diversity. And so, Lee came to the Queer Youth Center where I volunteered, and we had been friends before that. Uh, and she was trying to you know, figure out how to get kids involved, participants with her. And she started doing it the night I was kind of, the night I was already volunteering, so it was a really natural fit anyway. Plus, she's absolutely one of the coolest people that I know. She gave a TED Talk, posted a TED Talk for you, um, about being a surrogate, about having a baby and giving it away. And I got to draw little pictures in it. So, fun on that. Um, so we came in uh, and had kind of a, an ex long extended plan to do this documentary with the students. I think that nine of them involved, ended up kind of coming all the way through with it. Um, as it says in the video, it took about a year and a half. Uh, the thing about that is that it took about a year and a half meeting, sometimes once or twice a month. So it wasn't every day, it was through an after school center and program. So. So on, the flip, so on the good side of that, I think it took a long time for this, and I think it's something that can be modified for a class when you're seeing students all the time, uh, that you can make more progress than we did. Um, so the project was kind of framed, the, the beginnings of the project were about really just kind of getting kids thinking about some of the things we kind of mentioned here, like gender, sexuality, um, identity, kind of marginalized identities. Um, one of the first things we did was this Gender Genie Workshop, which was fantastic. Um, Lee's partner, Julie, and this other woman, Heidi, are drag kings in Columbus as well. And one of them had a costume maker friend. So they had these like elaborate genie outfits that they wore and did this workshop about uh, kind of like gender as a construct and gender stereotypes and how do we think about gender related to sexuality. So there were, there were workshops like that. And there were workshops about things like how do you you know, what does it mean to do a, a fade in? What does it mean to try to capture um, motion? How can you do something that's poetic instead of just um, literal kind of translation of like this, and then we went here. Um, so how can you kind of pull in metaphor and things like that for these two kids as well? Um, do you have any more background that you need for the video that we can pull in that? Um, 20 straws, the name 20 straws is probably the other thing people want. So the statistic, is, it's, I don't know how valid it is anymore or ever was, um, but often people talk about one in 10 people being gay, which is kind of a round figure. Uh, and so we talked about but what that would mean to have, if we thought about it in terms of men and women, I guess at the time. So we thought about this idea of 
you know, kind of one in 10, two in 20. And, you know, as we kind of went along, the students talked about how being, being gay or queer wasn't necessarily, you know, they always approached it as it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not that this is a bad thing. It's not negative to being gay. Um, but what happens is, is there's this whole negative perception of it. And how do we deal with that negative perception about being gay? Um, and so I think that, that was kind of their whole thing is how do we put this out there in ways that other people can understand who we are better without um, kind of having stereotypes. Uh, yeah. What do you think are the rules of misconstruction for um, Wait, what? What do you think are the rules of negative perception for the religion? So I mean, obviously, like the religion, politics. Religion is, what, is where I was going to go with it, really. I think that religion is the root of. I've done a lot of writing and thinking about this. Uh, another thing I do is called Big Gay Church. So my Actually, just, yeah, I was, that was my next question about <laughs> Big Gay Church. So it was, when was it established? It was like uh, 2015 or something? In 2010. 2010. Yeah. yeah. So I, uh, I was one of the your uh, daily research uh, for a high school university and we talked about the Big Gay Church. And it was very interesting how uh, So it happened almost, um, it happened really casually. It happened at the National Art Education Conference. And it happened um, pretty much, I think it probably, the, the genesis of it was a conversation um, between maybe three or, I know it was me and Jim Sanders and Kim Kozier, and I think there were a couple other people kind of tangentially involved in that first discussion. But it was like at the, the queer party or something, and maybe, not, maybe it was before that. Um, but the discussion was kind of like, well, like, why, what is wrong? Like, why are we even treated poorly? Like, where does this even come from? What's the problem? And we started thinking, like, what, you know, like, the three of us were from the South, and we were just like, you know, like, church was really, church and religion have had really, and I started thinking about it, and if you take church and religion out of it, there's no problem. I mean, if you take the moralizing of it out. Um, and so the discussion was, like, what if, what if church had been not only really okay with people being gay, what if they had been kind of celebratory about it? Like, what if we'd been treated like, hey, wow, this is great, you're different, it's fun. Um, and, and that's where we're like, well, what if we just tried it out? And what would it mean to have a big gay church? And so that's really how it started, was a little bit of a flippant conversation about what would it mean to have our own church. How many members do you have about? Jim, Jim, Sandy, right? Yeah, yeah, I would say, I'll, we probably have anywhere between The last one I went to, there was easily a hundred, like easily. It was. It's probably one of the best attended. It's probably one of the best attended um, events at the national conference that isn't a super session or hosted by, like a company. Like I hate I hate to say that, but they're the only the the thing that kind of breaks my heart about. NAEA is that like Crayola will do these kind of hokey. I'm not just picking on Crayola. Every everybody who makes an art supply will have a session at NAEA, and you make a thing, and they give you some freebies. And a lot of people go because they have good free stuff, but they're not always heavy hitting conceptually. And no. so Big Gay Church is is really interesting because it welcomes people across all. Um, level so you know whether you're a kindergarten teacher or you're a high school teacher or you're in higher education or you work in museums a lot of times at NAEA those groups don't always overlap and Big A Church cuts across that and um, and I think too that it, it is um, and a lot of students a lot of students who are trying to figure out like you guys you're trying to figure out where do I fit in the continuum of art education what kind of art teacher do I want to be Big A Church is a place where Students can go and meet other people who are pre-service, and they can and they can 
learn more about how to be allies or advocates, or they can find fellow um, queer teachers and and which is huge, you know, because in the, you know in so many in, in so many schools there's one art teacher, and that already is isolating. So imagine being an art teacher who's also queer, you know, and and so I think Big Gay Church is really it's an important connecting point for a lot of people. It's a place to go and learn about how to be an ally if you are straight, but you recognize the the complications of that, and you want to be there for your students. So you know I think again it's it's for teachers at any level and, and from any background. And it's for students. Ultimately, a lot of people go to Big Gay Church because they're trying to understand what would it mean to celebrate complexity? What would it mean to be supportive? And how can I do that in a way that is meaningful? Did you have a question, Tiara? I, I did. Um, I know you said something. Okay, I'm asking it now. Okay, so I'm curious about
the tobacco this guy's all his Taurus is his personal, you know, his whole personal life. I don't even know that much about it. So, but again, like if something opened up and students were interested in something, I'm, I'm a real big fan of um, emergent teaching. And so I love, I love a teachable moment where something might come up like that and be like, let's look, let's find it out. Let's come back tomorrow with some more information. So I don't know if that completely answers your question. It does. It, it, it really does. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're ready to watch the 